Well, hello, welcome. I'm Erin Schneider. I am an administrative associate with the North Central Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program. Hi, everyone. I'm Ray Flanagan, communications specialist for North Central Region Sayer. I also farm um, in Southwest Wisconsin. I'm here today for our next episode of um, Farming Matters. And I am really excited to, and grateful to be joined by the Glazik brothers, Will, Clay, and Dallas, and we'll give them a chance to share about their farmer rancher grant project and what they learned. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm Will. I'm the oldest and obviously best looking brother out of the us three. Uh, I do a lot of farm operations and on the distilling side of things, I'm kind of the building manager while we're remodeling. I'm Dallas, I'm the youngest brother, uh, and my role is I work on a farm and at the distillery, mainly just the, the catch all of anything else that needs done, and as well as uh, making sure all the finances, insurance, and legal stuff is all, all in order. And I'm Clay, I'm the middle brother. I'm not as involved on the farming aspect, but I did grow up on Cow Creek Organic Farm. I currently work in advertising as well as having my own design and branding company. And then I am also a certified bourbon professional. So I am very involved in the flavor profiles that we create um, within our whiskey and our other alcohols. So back uh, a year ago, roughly this time, um, we got a grant through SAIR, the Arts and Grain Collaborative, and uh, working with the Integrated Biological Research Lab at the University of Illinois to actually take a look at corn varieties and um, distill them into a corn whiskey and see how different varieties affect flavor themselves. So I guess outside of our farming background, in 2017, we started Silver Tree Beer and Spirits, uh, which is a company where we make our own alcohol. We've been making whiskey and vodka uh, since then. And uh, the reason why we got into it was that we were looking for ways to give more profit and value to the grains we grew on the farm. So we started selling to different breweries and distilleries. Then in 2017, got the opportunity to actually create our own company and start making our own products and getting them on the shelves. Uh, we've now expanded where we're, our vodka is in 40 different states. Uh, we're in some of the large retailers throughout the state of Illinois. And uh, we are coming out with a whiskey that's been aging since 2017. This fall, that'll be a rye, and then uh, looking for a bourbon to be released and hitting the shelves next year, as well as doing some other experimental whiskeys with uh, wheat, oats, doing different blends, um, and we'll also be doing some experimentations with uh, aging processes, and some of them will be, you know, as young as four years, some will be as old as 10 years. So we got a lot of exciting stuff coming down the uh, pipeline, as well as our own distillery, which we are working on currently in Pax, Illinois, looking to get our final license and start producing out there here this year. Then soon we'll be open to the public for uh, tastings and different things along those lines. So with the study itself, uh, we took a look at these different corn varieties and we distilled them to see you know, how the different corns, how the different flavors would change between the different varieties. So here is the still itself that the University of Illinois was able to purchase through the grant money. And here's Dallas and me, where we were sitting there actually just stealing and making the cuts and helped them understand uh, the production of whiskey. Uh, the team down there at the University of Illinois with the uh, Integrated Biological Research Lab was fantastic, but they have a background in industrial, uh, industrial alcohols, whereas we obviously, are not making ethanol. We wanted to make something a little more palatable to drink. So we came down there, did a few work, working sessions with them and uh, really showed them how to distill. So within that process, uh, there's really three cuts when you're looking at a pot still like they have there. There's the heads, hearts and tails. I mean, there are a lot of other cuts out there, um, but those are usually those, you know, those stories of the, you know, Moonshiner and the Appalachians that has gone blind through making the wrong cut. So we're not going to talk about those today. Um, so the heads are at a higher ABV. So it's those more volatile chemicals that burn off at lower temperatures. Uh, and those tend to be a little bit cleaner, more uh, alcoholic and ethanol type or rubbing alcohol type when you think about the flavors within actual spirits. The hearts are kind of the middle ground, and that's what the majority of the actual spirits that you consume are. 
whereas the tails are those uh, lower, higher vol or lower volatile uh, chemical compounds, take more heat to evaporate. And there's a lot more flavors in there, but with the more flavors, you do get some really bad and uh, unwanted flavors within those spirits. So in the actual distillations, you want kind of a blend of them all. Uh, the hearts is the key area that's where you're going to get your best flavor and your most actual product. But you want to kind of lead a little bit into the heads and a little bit into the tails. Um, but there's going to be a little bit that you put aside and run into different distillation batches that are just not good to consume for flavor. So within this actual study, since we want everything to be consistent and not be based off uh, actual distillation temperatures or by personal bias within flavors of pulling those cuts like most distillers do. Uh, we decided just to take the absolute middle keep. So that middle bar there, the darkest brown is what we use for the study. So if you're looking at these as consumer products, these samples will never actually hit the market because it's very just inefficient to be making these cuts and putting them into actual products that consumers would drink. But for consistency purposes, this is the best way to go about it. And then we did a whole blind tasting panel. So we got 16 different food, alcohol, distill distillation, research professionals, and also just whiskey enthusiasts to come in and do a blind tasting. Um, this was 100% corn whiskey. So there was no aging, blending, or any other grains added to the spirit. And we went in 100 proof to keep things consistent and minimize the variables within the different samples. Um, a perfect score is 20, and we did that with five on the nose, so breaking it down to nose, flavor, and finish. Uh, five on the nose, 10 on the palate, and five on the overall finish. And what those are, so nose is kind of like how it smells. You know, what characteristics are you able to pick out by just putting it up to your nose and inhaling? Um, smell is a huge factor of taste, and you know, if you think about when you're sick, if you're when you're all stuffed up and stuff tastes a little bit weird, the same thing happens within whiskey. So really what you're starting to pick up on the nose is influencing what you actually are able to taste on your palate itself. And we like to call that kind of preheating the chimney when you uh, put it up there and let the alcohol flow through a little bit, it warms the palate up and allows you to be able to taste better. Uh, palate, which is the, the biggest area of score, uh, that's how it actually tastes. Uh, you know, you really want to roll that around your tongue. What areas feel tingly? You know, is it in your bitter side, your sweet side? Because um, that's going to give you an idea of what characteristics are within there. And really, does, like, does that align with what you smelled? If what it tastes is totally different when you smelled, that's not going to be as consistent as a product as something that's very uh, much aligned with those two working together. And then uh, the lastly, finish, which was also out of five, it's how it does your mouth feel, you know? Does the flavor last long? Is it short? Is it burned? Does it silky or creamy? Uh, does it go down the, the esophagus? Does it tingle on the way down? Or is it kind of short and finished? All those um, affect how good the alcohol is. And since this was 100% corn whiskey, I um, want to just kind of go through and talk about some of the typical corn flavors. Well, most, most whiskeys are blends of multiple different grains, uh, bourbon being 51% corn on the minimum. Um, but there's usually you know, wheat, malted barley, rye, or any other different grain variety in the mix to make their kind of their mash bill. And in the actual whiskey itself, there's a lot of different factors and elements. You get the grain, water, yeast, and the oak, and those all affect the different flavors and the conagers or the chemical elements that assemble to create those scents and flavors within the whiskey. So since we're looking at just corn, we're actually we're taking away the uh, you know the oak, which actually accommodates for up to 75% of the overall flavor within final you know, store-bought whiskey. Um, and we use the same yeast and water across all the different corn samples, again, to minimize those variables and make everything consistent so there's no bias between the different samples. So within corn, um, a great way to think about whiskey flavors is to think about different types of bread. So corn, think of it kind of that, that sweet, buttery corn bread um, or a, you know, a corn chip. It's gonna have those sweet notes to it. It's gonna be very flavorful. Um, it's gonna be, could be a little more harsh depending on 
uh, the different profiles within it and the kind of the yield. But overall, you're looking for that sweetness of the overall corn. And again, we're not, this was not aged. This was just essentially a moonshine or what us as like to call a white dog or just corn whiskey. Uh, six or eight percent of that overall flavor can come from the barrels through the maturation process while the kind of is kind of, you know, evaporate into the barrel itself and contract based on the different seasons and pull those flavors back in. Uh, we have none of that in here. So we're looking at purely just the corn itself within the different samples. And a few of the kind of the calls within the study, uh, we only use one grain, grain sample from six different farms. Uh, they're all through the Great Lakes regions, but if we you know, had a lot of time, probably more a way to get more direct results would be to pull multiple samples from multiple different farms to make sure that you know, there wasn't one farm that had a better growing season or you know, hail sort of come through and hurt the yield on one, one strain. Um, so it's something that maybe in the future we can look at to expand it out to. Uh, we did use the same yeast and fermentation process on every single sample to keep that as a constant. So we weren't adding more variables to the, uh, to the study itself because there were, were a lot of different variables within uh, the different corn varieties. And the cuts were made by temperature, not flavor aroma. As a distiller, um, you're kind of going through and making those cuts based off how it smells or how it tastes, based on your own personal preferences. It's kind of the art behind this distillation. But to keep that bias out of there, we did make it off the cut and we took those center of the hearts cuts so everything's consistent. And then um, as far as the tasting goes, tasting order we found does have a pretty high effect on how the scores are uh, scored. Because as alcohol tends to alter the palate after long periods of usages, you know, um, as the day went on, it was a long day of drinking. You know, it was very, very tough work on, on everyone's part within the panel. But as alcohol does have effect on the body, and that can obviously alter how you score different products. So here's the overall scores uh, that we had between the 16 different judges. Uh, so we took the average itself and took the standard deviation. So we some pretty interesting things right off the bat is that Yellow Dent actually had the average, the highest average score. Um, but when you look at standard deviation, so the closer the clusters, the uh, Fleurony Red and the uh, Blue Hybrid scored extremely well as far as consistency across the 16 different judges. Um, so this was definitely a little bit surprising on our end, where you know yellow didn't score so high, uh, it was cool seeing the Wapsie Valley and also the red and the blue being very close. Uh, the white did not score as well, and the Bloody Butcher, who uh, you know, kind of some of the pre-study conversations we were having, a lot of people thought that, or at least were most intrigued by this corn variety and uh, what it could bring to the table as far as flavor profiles. But when we started looking at the actual breakdowns within the scores themselves, there's uh, some really interesting patterns we started to pick out. So we went through and marked all the yellow highlighted areas as a high score being over a 17, so 17 to 20. The lowest scores were um, zero all up to six. And then everything else was throughout. But as some of the patterns we pulled out that we thought were extremely interesting was that 19% of the highest scores were done by the researchers. So that means that the people that were actually going through and distilling these different uh, corn varieties were the scoring them based off, uh, there might've been a little bit of bias within the scores because whether it was a completely blind test, but if there's some sort of sample that you know struck a, uh, know in their mind that, you know, that made it very recognizable. They might have scored that higher or lower based off their biases through the actual uh, distillation process. And they also contributed to 50% of the low scores. So there's definitely, uh, whether they knew it or not, they had some, you know, unconscious biases within those samples. The next one was that 100% of the Yale Dent high scores were scored by industry professionals and whiskey enthusiasts. So people that have made their entire career around making bourbon and whiskey that are used to yellow dent being the primary corn within uh, on-market bourbons, 
uh, they tend to gravitate towards that because that's where they're used to. And people like consistency and, and change is something that kind of can be drawing. Um, and we also noticed that the standard deviation increased as the day prolonged and alcohol was consumed. So one of those last calls that uh, made you know, two slides ago is that the standard deviation was uh, lower within the red and the blue varieties, but also, you know, as that was the order that the samples were consumed. So as people started drinking, their highs and low, lows uh, were getting more prevalent, opposed to kind of getting those medium ranges of scores where everything was a little bit more consistent. So I thought those were some really cool and in interesting patterns. And I'll go back to the slide here so you can kind of see how those patterns were taking effect. Whereas, you know, the researchers were up there at the top. They definitely had the highest amount of high scores and low scores based on some of those, um, you know, unconscious biases of working with these grains and dis distilling them, even though it was a completely blind test. And then as you see the yellow dent, those four high scores all came down to professionals and uh, a retailer and an enthusiast who, you know, have work with the yellow dent corn and they've made their careers around that specific corn variety. But really outside these scores, where we find the most interest um, or most value coming out of this test is the different flavor profiles that are being created by these different corn varieties. One thing that we had all the 16 different judges do, as well as putting down the scores for each of their nose their palate and their finish, and then their overall was also write down what they're tasting and what they're smelling and what kind of flavors they're getting. And we started seeing a lot of consistencies across uh, these different judges with each sample of corn. So we pulled out um, any of the different flavor profiles that had four or more people say the same thing. So with the, uh, with the red, a lot of people said it was clean, crisp, had some you know fruity, notes to it, a little bit of kind of grassy or earthy notes and bringing in that cornbread or sugary cereal, which is very consistent with any sort of corn whiskey. Within the blue, they said it was you know, softer, lighter. So getting a bit of that fruity tones, but it was a little more on the floral side. So think of like, you know, blossoms. Um, it had a little bit of nuttiness and cracked pepper as well. Uh, the Wapsie Valley, which had a very high average on there. So it was like pretty high across the board. Um, it had a little more earthiness to it, you know, some cloves, some baking spice, but it had a really creamy finish. Whereas the white, um, this was definitely the most earthy out of all of them. You know, people were picking up some tobacco or coffee, a little bit of must or clover in there. Uh, yellow don't dent, which um, even looking at the blind samples, people were able to, you know, these are pretty consistent across what people look for within actual yellow dent bourbon. So, that, you know, that sweet corn, kind of some skewed tomatoes, white pepper, some pitted fruit. And then lastly, the Bloody Butcher um, had, you know, the cornmeal, the grassy kind of popcorn, corn chips, which all aligns with what Bloody Butcher corn is made, meant for, which is grits and cornmeal and things on those lines. So we thought this was probably the most useful uh, information coming out of the study itself, because now we're able to take this and within our own products and also whoever can you know, if you're this distillery and looking to make something unique, you know, that has a little more tobacco earthy tones, maybe you might want to take a look at this study and say, hey, we should try to get some different white varieties. Or if you're looking for something that's a little more floral, look at those, you know, the red or the blue hybrids. But if you're looking for, you know, something that's a little more savory or creamy, you know, the Wapsie Valley Bloody Butcher are good options to use in that bourbon. So you can start really taking that and making something that's unique to you and what flavor profiles you're wanting to make as a distiller. There, I'm just, I'm, I'm really like blown away in, in like a lot of great ways here and just like hearing your, share your story. And I'm, I was thinking of all the different parts that had to line up and people along the whole from grain to glass, so to speak. Um, how, like for your grant project, how was that? Getting the grain part wasn't too bad. Uh, we just, I knew some people that had these different varieties that we were interested in, called them up and we were able to pick them up direct or ship them through the mail, something like that. And we weren't working with a large amount, just a hundred pounds of each. And I think that overall, like the university, they did a great job of kind of spearheading and coordinating a lot of the actual logistical sides of getting every, all the different pieces to work together. 
Okay. Same thing with AGC. Yes, AGC was a huge aspect as well. Um, so really was some, we had some great partners going into it, which made it a lot easier on the coordination side. What, what kind of happens with some of the, the end distillation, the mash part that you mentioned, does it go back to the soil or get transformed into other, other things too, or? Uh... Yeah, so as far as like the, uh, the waste from the mash itself, um, that can actually go in to make cattle feed or uh, hog feed. So you can take that and kind of strain it out, get the fluids out of there and have a very nutritious feed for uh, livestock. As far as the distillation, um, with the, what you don't use within the heads and the tails, uh, you usually just throw that back into the next round. So, uh, so the next batch of whiskey that you make, see if you can pull off some of those different flavors and get them inside the hearts. But a lot of different distilleries that aren't able to, you know, they keep getting in the same heads and hearts. So they'll take that and maybe add some flavoring to it. So it's a little bit more palatable than able to, you know, create a product similar to, um, you know, a, an, a peach vodka or something like that. So it's not taking the best product, but they're adding some other flavor in there. So they're able to reuse that and not just throw that out. What, what would you recommend, like a piece of advice you would offer to another farmer or someone who was interested in, you know, whether it's whiskey or distillation or just introducing a new product because that you're doing a lot of pro like marketing and product testing along with like, you know, trying to figure out how to best grow the gra different grains and stuff too. Yeah, I mean, I'd definitely say to jump into it and try it, but, you know, if you can get some of these seeds are kind of hard to find. Um, so get, you know, a small plot, grow it out. A lot of the open pollinated heirloom varieties on, on a farm scale can be kind of a pain. <laughs> uh, they're just, you know, they were grown before everything got mechanized, uh, but they do offer some really unique flavors and you can save your own seed and select for what attributes you're looking for. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to select and, and to build something that's truly your own. Uh, that's another thing. So like the bloody butcher that we grow might be totally different than John Webkin grows in Wisconsin and completely different than someone in New York state might be growing. Yeah. I guess another call would be from a farmer if they're looking to jump into growing these varieties um, you know, have those conversations with the buyer, you know, figure out that you can actually have a market for it. Uh, let people know that you're doing this, you know, or say you are talking to a brewer, uh, your farmer in Wisconsin talking to a brewer, figure out like what they want within their different beers and tailor towards them. So you can open up those markets, guarantee those sales and make sure they're able to produce at the same level that they're looking to buy. Even outside of alcohol, there's a lot of cool grain studies going on right now. Oh, yeah. It's a very exciting time for farming. When do we get to come down to your grand opening? And we're hoping for uh, around this time next year, so 2023, but I'd say 24. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been a long process. Um, but if, you know, if anyone would like to sample the products before uh, we're open to the public, you can go to spirithub.com and they can deliver right to your door. And um, we're in 40 different states on there.